So welcome, whoa, there we go, sorry. Um, welcome to our 11 a.m. session um, for today's Social Media Week um, panel with Scripps and Viggle. We are super excited to have you here. Um, keep in mind, we do have a hashtag going for the week, which is hashtag UT UTSMW. And I know that Chad has a hashtag of his own for today's session too, which is right up here on the screen. Um, again, we're super excited to have all four of our panelists. Chad Perisman is director of Convergent Media at Scripps Networks Interactive, right here. He's also a Disney expert, I've learned, so if you love Disney. Um, Abby McCullum, we just bonded over a very quick sprint to um, parking lot G10 and back. Um, <laughs> and Abby is director of Convergence at Scripps. Christine Cinnamon um, is manager of the home category brand research at Scripps. And then Miles um, Stiverson came all the way to, from New York City to join us. Um, Miles is editorial director at Viggle. Um, and Chad flew in too from New Jersey, New York City area. So thank you so much to all four of you for being here. Thank you guys for being here. And um, free Cokes in the back just in case you get thirsty. Um, oh, sign in sheet is going around too. So make sure you sign. Okay, thanks. There we go. Oh, geez. Now I'm really bad. Um, morning, everyone. Um, so thanks for the, the introduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, social TV today. I'll let um, everyone else kind of introduce themselves a little bit more. So uh, uh, Chad Powersman at C. Powersman um, with Scripps Networks. I've been there for nearly nine years now in a couple of different roles. Uh, I now work on convergent media, which is kind of anywhere the TV and digital uh, intersect. Those are kind of the areas. So social media, big part of that arena. Um, and then uh, my partner in crime over at Scripps is uh, Abby McCollum. Hello. I'm Abby McCollum. I'm the director of Convergence. So there you go. I'm, I'll just let both. Who knows this works? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm at Abby McCollum on Twitter. I am the director of Convergence, so my job is to take all of the TV content that's on HGTV and put it on the website for our show pages, for our talent, and also with social integration into the pages as well. I'm Christine Cinnamon. I'm the brand research manager for DIY Network and for social media. And I've been at Scripps for five years almost now. And previously I was at Fox Sports and Fuel TV and WGN America before that. My main job is looking at the ratings for DIY Network, but we've kind of realized that we also need to look at how the tweets and how social media uh, affects ratings and hopefully makes them go up. Hey, Miles Diverson. Um, I'm at a startup called Viggle, which I'll uh, explain a little bit of, about what Viggle is shortly. But uh, my main focus is uh, content and how to engage users uh, on the second screen. That works. Um, so, uh, so this is how TV used to be viewed, um, right? It was like one person on a couch watching probably like a couple of channels. Um, this is kind of the view of what watching TV looks like now, right? Um, so just want to kind of take a quick bolt. So how many people actually have a TV in their head? Like watch con and consume most of their television on a t TV screen? Surprisingly, most people, we got like a couple people over here that are like, screw that, who needs a TV, I don't have enough room. Um, and then, so how many people also have cable, like pay for cable in their house? All right, a couple less people. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I wanted to, to get a sense of. And how much of that TV do you actually like, you'd say the majority of your television you watch through cable versus watching it on a computer? Like, do you still watch? Through the box, we got some like nods here. Anybody watch most of their television through a laptop, tablet? We got a couple people willing to raise their hand. Awesome. Um, so yeah, the way the way that kind of TV viewing uh, is happening now is is really changing. The way that people interact with TV has grown up considerably. So this is this is actually from last summer. So 
uh, imagine that this chart is now bigger, but these are all of the players in some sense that somehow have to do with social television. Um, lots of, I know, don't worry about who's actually on there, but you know, you've got everything from Apple TV and, and Roku to players like Viggle to partners, uh, companies that we work with like Telescope that actually put tweets on screen. So lots of players, lots of money being invested in this space. Um, lots of new startups coming out all the time. Lots of startups being bought. Uh, Twitter bought two companies this week specifically around social TV. So lots going on in that space. But I want to talk about what uh, 2014 looks like at HGTV for us at, at Scripps Networks now. So um, New Year's Day, this is probably what it looked like for most of you. <laughs> right? So we might be still celebrating. We might have been watching a bowl game. Might have been sitting by the fire if you were up in the Northeast. Uh, probably had a couple of Tylenols. Um, this is, uh, for, for several of us at Scripps, this is how we started um, New Year's Day morning. So, any Property Brothers fans in the audience? Awesome. Lots of those like, yes, absolutely. Love those guys. Um, so they the, they, the brothers have been great to work with. Um, they're, they're definitely our most socially active of all the talent over at, uh, over at HGTV. But here was the cool thing. So we broadcast uh, the Rose Parade uh, live uh, every, every New Year's Day uh, without commercial interruption. And so this is really awesome. This is literally if you turned in at 11 o'clock in the morning, um, the, first, the very first thing they said was like, here's the hashtag, tweet us. Uh, and this really has kind of set the mark for how we're, vi we're uh, visualizing social TV at HGTV for, for the rest of this year. And so the result of that was throughout the entire day, we had this Twitter bar going along the screen. And um, so you know, we had all kinds of tweets about the parade itself. Um, we had uh, you know, people excited for marching bands uh, because we don't have commercial interruption. Um, we actually did some grassroots uh, reaching out where we went to all of the marching band uh, around the country that were going to be in the parade, gave them the hashtag and told all the band parents, all the you know, faculty members at school to use that because if you watched on any other network, most likely during the marching bands is when they cut out. Um, you know, they're normally going to commercial, they're showing some other ridiculousness. So you know, we, we had a lot of folks tweeting in that day you know, specifically for like, go Johnny with your sousaphone. Um, and uh, you know, again, people right, love the fact that you know, we had it without commercials uh, for that day. And then, so these are just a bunch more tweets. And so halfway through, this is about an hour into the broadcast, um, this was, we went back to the brothers. And they, everyone certainly has an opinion of which brother they think is more handsome. Um, you know, and so this was a great thing. You know, we do it live. This is really the only thing, one of the few things that we do live every year. But the fact that we could get that level of integration where they're talking about the tweets appearing on screen, trying to interact with folks. They've actually got their phones out, you know, talking with our fans um, was kind of a, was a, a really significant factor to kind of kick off uh, the, the year for us. And then after the parade, we actually had all new episodes of all of these other shows, which again, you know, for anyone that watches a lot of television, you typically don't get a lot of new episodes in a row. You don't normally see that on HGTV. You normally see eight episodes of House Hunters in a row. <laughs> um, and maybe two of them are new. So, uh, you know, this, was, this is significant for us. We call it all premiere New Year. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple of years now. And so, you know, we really use this to kind of extend what we were going to do with the Rose Parade uh, for the rest of the day. And we worked with our talent, and we actually provided them these hats and clappers and all kinds of other uh, toys for them to post uh, photos. And this is a bunch of our talent. This is some of our fans, you know, all talking about what they were doing for hashtag HGTV New Year um, and how they were celebrating with us. They were interacting with people during their shows. Um, they were tweeting along. Some of them got shown on TV. Some of them it was purely 
uh, just about interaction with their, with their fans for the day. So in addition to putting tweets on air, which was kind of a crazy endeavor, we had never put tweets on air, so we decided to do it on New Year's Day for 12 hours. Um, and by putting the tweets on air, we actually had to moderate all of them, which we'll show in just a second. Um, but this is what we had on HGTV.com. So we had a stream showing every tweet that had the hashtag HGTV New Year. And this lived on a special URL that we had that was HGTV.com backslash New Year that we also promoted throughout the entire day. So people could go there, see their tweets on HGTV, take screen grabs, share it with their friends. And then if you go to the next one, Chad. We also had a photo stream with all of the Instagram pictures throughout the day. Um, we had people moderating these because we were a little bit worried that people might see the hashtag and put some undesirable pictures up there. So we had, some we had a whole team working that day. We had people moderating just the photo stream to make sure that everything that came up on our site was appropriate and fun. We had people moderating the Twitter stream and then the tweets on air also. This is how we did that. So we use a company called Telescope. So we got 25,000 tweets that day. And we could obviously not put up 25,000 tweets. So we had to go through all of them, look at the content of the tweets, pick the ones that we thought were best, and then we would put them in a bookmarked folder, which was kind of a holding zone. So we actually had, I think, three people working just this on New Year's Day. So someone would look at the, twi the Twitter stream, someone would bookmark them, and then from the bookmarked, we would put them into approved folder. And then the approved were the ones that were actually on TV. So we had a lot to consider. You know, did they mention talent? Did they talk about New Year's Day? Were they, you know, talking about our non, uh, the uncommercials? It was a lot that we had to kind of consider. And we also had each commercial break, we could have a certain number of tweets. So we could put up 12 tweets, and then we had to dump them and find 12 new tweets. So this is how the segments worked that day. So we could put, in the three minute span, we could put 18 tweets. So then we had a minute and a half to dump all those and find 12 more tweets. So New Year's Day was the first time we had ever done this, and it was the most stressful day of my entire life. I spent um, a day in one of our rooms staring at a TV and a computer screen, going back and forth, up and down, looking at the screen, making sure they looked okay, looking at my Twitter screen for 12 hours. And now when we do it on Friday nights for two hours, it goes by in two seconds, and it's the easiest thing. But this was a little bit stressful. But it turned out great. The amount of tweets that we got from our fans saying how much they loved it was huge. We also got a lot of tweets from people saying that they just liked interacting with other fans. So that alone made it a success for us. We also got the tweets going viral. We, I think we trended for hours that day. Into the next day. Yeah, into the next day, which was huge for us to be USA trending for the whole day into the next day with a hashtag that we had just started that day. So we considered it a huge success. It was crazy, but awesome at the same time. Um, and then this is how we use Adobe Marketing Suite's social feed to actually moderate our Twitter feed. So we were watching talent handles, hashtags. Yeah, so any, any mention of, so yeah, so this was, and this was kind of my, so I work up in New York, so I sequestered myself in my office, being in my spare bedroom in my house, uh, for the entire day while my wife got to do whatever she wanted. Um, but this is kind of the moderation. So any mention of HGTV, any mention of the official hashtag, then we had another column that was just all of the shows throughout the day, and we kind of kept refreshing that. So it went from the Rose Parade to Island Hunters to Hawaii Life. Um, so anyone that didn't use the official hashtag, we wanted to make sure we were capturing. And this is basically, you know, replying, retweeting, favoriting, you know, making sure that it wasn't, you know, we wanted to have a two-way conversation with these folks. So, you know, the people that, if HGTV, the official account, actually replies to them or favorites their tweet, all that does is create another tweet because they're like, OMG, can't believe, you know, my favorite channel just, you know, favorited me, you know, just replied to me, super excited. Um, and then the last one was uh, what I called HGTV famous. So this was basically, I took all of the potential things, so all those other search terms and then said, only show me people that have more than 10,000 followers. Um, because what I didn't want to miss out is um, we had done a show back in December around the White House and Michelle Obama uh, tweeted about HGTV, right? Mind blown, huge for us. We didn't realize it for like three hours later until someone was like, hey, did you see like, you know, First Lady talked about HGTV. So we wanted to make sure like if we had another moment like that, that 
we were on top of it that we can get it on TV, we could retweet it, you know, we could make as much hay out of it as possible. So that was kind of that, uh, that fourth column. any kind of famous, you text me and tell me that you saw their tweet. I mean, sorry, any network ever. If you see anyone who is remotely famous, send me a text. So people were sending me texts throughout the day, like, did you see that so-and-so tweeted you? And a lot of them were our own talents. We were seeing that. We just wanted to make sure that we got everything we could possibly do to hype up that day even more. So. It was so successful, and I'm the one that measures that. <laughs> So there were more than 1,000 tweets on screen that they did, more than 26,000 Twitter mentions of our hashtag. That's ginormous for us. Like We don't normally get that in a day, let alone a couple of days, weeks. Um, there were more than 11,000 tweets at HGTV, viewers trying to talk to the network. More than 5,000 just at the Property Brothers, who clearly people like them. People are asking them to marry them more than once <laughs> um, during New Year's Day and a lot of people wanting to talk to them. And they even had you know, asked all sorts of talent, but asking Nancy O'Dell, like, oh, where's your shirt from? And she's replying to them, oh, it's Kate Spade, thanks. Like, <laughs> thanks for watching. Um, there were more than 36,000 total mentions of HGTV anywhere on, the, on Twitter that one day, which is really, really huge. And um, according to Social Guide, which is Nielsen's Social Guide, and they're doing Twitter ratings, just like they do the television ratings, and more than 1.96 million unique people saw tweets. That means they saw at least one tweet. They could have seen 15, 20, and if they were watching all day, they probably saw a lot more than that. But it means that, and other than sports, the Rose Parade on HGTV was the most social program on television, according to Social Guide, that day, which has never happened for us before. It's the most social day that the network has ever had. And it was really just amazing to be able to rank that high in comparison to other networks. The kinds of television that usually rank really high on Twitter mentions are sports and award shows, not necessarily repeats of House Hunters. Um, so it's, it's a huge deal to be able to rank like that. When we have a big premiere, we can bump it up. And the new uh, HGTV Fridays that have been going on this quarter have been very, very helpful. And it's awesome to see us being able to compete in that space. us just because, um, you know, Bravo competitors. So for someone to say that they're swapping housewives for houses um, was was really great. And again, you know, getting getting back to, you know, do people actually enjoy the additional content and, and the socializing of it? You know, this this kind of came late in the day. But for someone to say that the tweets themselves have been as entertaining as the shows was a really big win for us. Um, just from the perspective of you know. We were really worried, you know, what's the kind of reaction? Is the HGTV audience really gonna accept this type of social activity? Um, the number of negative mentions was significantly lower than we were, like we were really expecting potentially some backlash because it was the first time and got very little uh, of that. So this was, this was really great to see and kind of help justify all the work that we did. Was the daytime was the highest rated it has ever been for that for New Year's Day, which is always a very very highly rated day. But the interaction, you know, doing all that, it's great to be fun, but is it worth like the return on the investment? And for that day, absolutely. And we track all of these events that we're doing to see like are the ratings going up, and if the ratings aren't going up, or is at least our median age going down so that we are getting more of the viewers that our advertisers want to pay for. Um, the HGTV Fridays that have been going on since the 17th, I believe, they have been renovation realities especially. Um, it lowered our median age, which for HGTV is normally like 55, 56, 57, around there, and it lowered them to 50 for that two-hour block, sometimes even hitting 49, which is a huge jump. And we can't say it's definitely because of this, but it probably isn't hurting it. Um, but it's nice to see those things line up and make it worthwhile from a ratings perspective. So, yeah, so New Year's Day was so successful that they wanted us to keep going. So we decided that Friday nights were the window that we were going to look at. So from 8 to 10 on Friday nights, we worked with our programming team to look at a show that would reach out to a younger audience, like Christine was saying, 
and we decided that Renovation Realities was the show we were going to target. Renovation Realities is an unhosted show that shows normal people renovating their houses, and they do crazy stuff. I mean, the I, the crazy, so it's insane. Like <laughs> chainsaws, they rip out their own sinks and bathrooms and electrical, and it's crazy. It's you perfect for Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Twenty seconds. Yeah. How long did that take? Yeah. Always. Always. So amplify that towards like, I'm gonna redo my kitchen in a weekend. Yeah. Um, and five days later, and they're still like scraping the tile off the floor. Like, yeah, that's the best part. So they they always show at the beginning of the show, you know, redo the kitchen, five day timeline, a thousand dollar budget, and then at the end they're like fifteen days, five thousand dollars. So. We decided to, <laughs> exactly, that was actually, I think we reached out to the showrunner for the show and got some facts about the show, and that we put up tweets throughout it, and one of them was about divorce. <laughs> it said something like, 40% of the people got divorced at the end of this, or I can't remember what it was. But so, we got great response from this. We started a new hashtag called HGTV Fridays, and so we put it on our HGTV Twitter account, and then put up tweets throughout the day, or throughout the eight to 10 window, and they were hysterical. People were loving seeing their own tweets on screen. On Instagram, we started seeing a lot of pictures show up of people taking pictures of their tweets. So then it got even more viral because the hashtag just perpetuated itself without us even having to do anything about it. So this is one example. Um, that, I mean, they were just great. Some of the guys, the thing is that we could do it so quickly. So for ex one example was a guy had a chainsaw and he almost cut off his head. I mean, it cut him right here, it was so close. But because it happened right then, and we had you know, a minute and a half to find eight new tweets for the next segment, of course, every single tweet was chainsaw, chainsaw, chainsaw. <laughs> so, so we were able to grab those really quickly, so as soon as the next commercial break ended and came back on with another Twitter stream, we had you know, four tweets about, oh my god, that guy almost cut his head off with a chainsaw. So then everyone kind of felt like they were watching it along with all these other people too, and experiencing the same thing, which was really cool. Um, my mom is so stressed out, she had to leave the room, let me know when they're done with the electrical. <laughs> I mean, it was hysterical, just watching it in the room with the three other people I was with was hysterical. Everyone seems to think that, um, you can use a sawzall next to a live oak. Oh, come on, yeah. sorry. Uh, everyone seems to think that, uh, like, I'm gonna cut through, uh, that one will work too, when we go to Miles. Um, Everyone, yeah, that uh, like, I don't need to turn off the electricity to my house when I'm cutting near this giant wire. Yeah. Um, pretty much every episode when that happens, know. and that's the one thing that like everyone gets on us for. Yeah. Um, but it's truly a fly on the wall. I think we, from the showrunner, we've done lots of episodes. I think only three people have ever gone to the hospital yeah. um, for, right. for, the, uh, for the entire run. Um, no one's been seriously maimed or lost a finger or anything like that. So, you know, it, it, it usually works out o o okay. <laughs> um, so we want to include a, the fourth member of our panel that, so it's not just about hey. HGTV. <laughs> yeah. and um, let, me, let me first off just kind of express my gratitude that Chad is using the clicker, because those things always fail when I touch them. <laughs> so I'm like super, super thankful, so. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where I work. It's called Viggle, um, and the, the kind of pie chart a few slides back that, that Chad put up sort of demonstrates how crowded the space is and how many different approaches there are to social TV and, and what second screen means. So I'm going to speak a little bit about, um, you know, what we do and, and kind of where we've been and, and yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, talk about where we've been, uh, where we are now, where we're going, uh, kind of how, how our product has evolved. So Viggle. Um, I joined back in uh, October 2011, and we launched the following February, so I was kind of uh, there when it was just a bunch of things on a whiteboard, and it's been really interesting to, to kind of, when you're in a room talking about what, what does it mean uh, to, what's second screen mean, what's social TV mean, how do we engage people, how do we uh, get people to kind of interact with, uh, you know, everybody's on their mobile device when they're watching TV, that's, that's kind of a proven fact, that people are doing things like checking email or, or tweeting or, or doing whatever, and so, we uh, sought out to create a product that engaged them in a different way uh, in the place they're already at. They're, they're on their phone, they're on their tablet while they're watching TV. So um, here's kind of a, a basic rundown of, of what Viggle is. So we're an app uh, for both iOS and Android. Um, while you're watching TV, you can check into a show. So you tap a button and we listen to your TV for about 10 seconds. We recognize what you're watching and we check you in. 
um, right off the bat you start earning points. Um, and we feature certain shows, like HGTV shows for example, um, in which you can get more points for checking in. So we're, we're creating an incentive to check in, to, to tune into to that channel and then to, to check in. You start earning points and uh, you can then earn additional points for engaging around that show. So for example, we uh, create experiences um, like trivia and polls that are pushing content while you're watching the show. So it's really adding this layer of content uh, on top of the, you know, your first screen obviously being your TV. On your second screen, you're getting additional uh, facts, trivia. Um, you're able to weigh in and, and kind of express your opinion right there on your device. Uh, and all the while, you're, you're earning more points. Um, we have a, a social graph that we've built into the app so that you can see what other people are checking into. You can follow kind of like-minded uh, TV watchers and, and kind of discover new shows for, uh, you know, people who have the same interests as you. And while you're earning all these points, uh, the, the kind of one thing that sets us apart from other people in this space who, who have uh, sort of these same sorts of uh, uh, achievements uh, while you're engaging is that you can redeem your points for real rewards, like gift cards to Starbucks, Amazon, iTunes, things like that. So we call ourselves the first loyalty program for TV, much like a credit card um, has a loyalty program for, for using their, uh, their service. Um, so that's, this is kind of, uh, you know, where, where we think we fit into the space. Um, and, you know, w one of the things we found over, over the course of operating for the first 18 months is that we're super, super good at getting people to open their app, in the, the Bigel app in prime time, and um, engaging during a show. Um, my focus is on this uh, experience in the, in the middle there called Viggle Live, which is um, essentially creating content experiences while you're watching a program. And for an hour long show, when we do a Viggle Live, uh, people engage for 28 minutes, which is really high. Um, there's you know, very few apps that people engage with for, for that duration. Um, I feel like the only one I use is, is Candy Crush, where I'm kind of like um, always at. So we aspire for, for Candy Crush levels of engagement here with, with Fig Alive. Um, so this is, uh, again, kind of uh, where we're at and, and uh, where we discovered that we're, we're awesome at engaging people during a show. Um, in the last couple months, we've, we have kind of expanded our, our reach to uh, really widen um, what, what social TV is and, and, and means for us as, as a company. So um, we acquired a company called uh, Digit a few months ago, and, and they have a really cool technology in which they can um, basically embed uh, code on, on a website, a, a network's website, for example, that lets people set a reminder for a show. So they say, okay, I've just watched an, an ad for um, you know, House Hunters, and that looks awesome. I really want to remember to watch a show when it's on the air. So they tap a button, and then they have a calendar uh, reminder set. They get a, a ping on their phone you know, half hour before the show is on. Um, so this is really kind of, you know, again, we Viggo Live and things like that are awesome for engaging people during a program. This is really kind of before the program when, when you're kind of, uh, you know, getting your, your marketing out there and, and, and um, advertising your show. This kind of creates the, the starting point at which, okay, here's the beginning of where we start to engage you with this program. And so that's, you know, up to a week before the show is, is, is uh, kind of the sweet spot for that. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So we acquired another company called Wet Paint. So Wet Paint is a, uh, a entertainment website that produces a ton of content, uh, 200 articles a day, uh, all about TV, uh, TV shows. And um, you know, wh one, of the, one of the really neat things about this is that uh, there's a re Wet Paint has a really active uh, sort of readership um, that uh, engages with TV shows after they air. So there's a lot of recaps, um, there's uh, you know, a lot of community of people kind of uh, talking to each other and, and getting filled in on, on the show after it's aired. So this is really, uh, you know, for us, having this kind of massive content engine and a really passionate audience, um, and, and kind of another sort of key to, to Wet Paint is that their um, social presence is really strong. So a lot of the traffic that Wet Paint gets is, is from uh, Facebook. Uh, they're, you know, they're creating content and they have this really refined, uh, what they call the social distribution system, which, um, you know, kind of identifies who's a fan of what and then puts out the right sort of content at the right time during the day. Um, it does really quick testing and optimizes all of, all of the content and then gets the traffic back to the website. So, um, you know, this made a lot of sense for us and, and, and uh, kind of holistically looking at a, a, a 
platform that engages people you know, before a show, during a show, and then after a show. So this is kind of the, the lifespan of, of a uh, Viggo Loop user where we're, you know, it, it's kind of, a, again, a one-week sweet, uh, sweet spot where we're engaging them before the show, they're setting a reminder, um, they're checking in uh, with Viggle, they're earning points, they're playing Viggle Live, and then they're engaging after the event uh, to kind of weigh in with, with uh, how they felt uh, after the show. So that's, a, you know, a, again, a really quick rundown. And um, it's, you know, in the last couple years that, that I've been with Viggle, it's really been a fascinating space to, to sit in, in this, uh, this second screen uh, sphere and, and to kind of see where, where, where um, you know, there's a lot of different approaches. It, it, there's these kind of tightly curated social experiences where, you know, you're, you're syncing with every moment of the broadcast, or you have kind of the, the fire hose of Twitter in which you're kind of curating tweets as they come in. Um, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the content of the program um, can really kind of define how a, a second screen experience uh, uh, goes. Um, with something like HGTV programming, um, there's so much, uh, there's so much of uh, content that is kind of left on the cutting room floor. You have a, you know, half hour program um, that has, you know, th it is what it is, but there's so many other questions that people might have, like what, what kind of tool did they use here, or what's the proper technique to do this thing that, that I saw. So the second screen is really an opportunity to add this layer of content, um, again, where, where people already are. They're already on their, their mobile device while they're watching TV, and it really creates a rich uh, kind of content layer on top of already awesome programming. Uh, move into the discussion. I'm going to go sit down and not stand up anymore. Um, so if you have a question for us, we'll definitely we'll pass the mic around, but um, you can also get my attention on Twitter. Um, who's, who's Annie Sadler doing a really good job of covering? Oh, it must be someone. Oh. She must be watching on the, hi. That's awesome, like total, like super coverage from not even someone in the room. Um, I guess everyone else that's been on their phone is just um, Snapchatting and not talking about us. Um, so uh, starting with, uh, with Miles and, and you know, you guys engage, uh, you know, we're, we're engaging on Twitter, you guys have a platform for, for Viggle Live. You know, why, why do you think that viewer engagement around TV has become so popular and kind of so important you know, in the past couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when I, when I sit down and watch TV, my instinct is to grab my phone for whatever reason. And um, I think that TV these days, I, I feel like there's kind of been this crescendo of, of uh, amazing programming. And I think to people have always sort of, while they're watching TV, you know, they, they say the water cooler, it, that, that's kind of the old, um, standby for the next day after a show airs, you're you're gathering at the water cooler um, to to talk about what happened last night. Um, the the uh, the fact that you can now engage with a smartphone while you're laying on your couch and talk to other t uh, talk to other people who are watching the same thing is really kind of the the translation of the the water cooler moment in real time while you're watching. Um, I think uh, you know again when a show is edited for their on air broadcast, there's a lot of content that that doesn't make the broadcast for because of time constraints. Um, the ability to both deliver that content uh, to anybody who wants a deeper experience, and also create a, a, an environment in which people can talk about it while they're watching, um, and, and can kind of, you know, um, talk to each other during those surprising moments or, or whatever it might be. I think is um, it's you know it's we're not in, inventing a behavior. We're, we're we're people are already kind of have already been doing this for years and years and years. It's just the technology is kind of getting to a place where we can facilitate all of those things that are, are really a natural behavior. And uh, you know, in our case, and in Viggle's case, incentivize some of that behavior with points. You guys, maybe, is this? No, still not. There we go. Yeah. Sure. I'll just hold it. Um, <laughs> We are definitely using social to engage with our audience. We were already using social to remind people to watch our TV shows. You know, we were putting the tune-in information out every day to say, here's the shows that are on tonight, everyone tune in. By actually then becoming a participant while they're watching it, while, with the hashtags, by liking things, by favoriting them, by watching Instagram, by watching Facebook, by everything that we can reach our audience to see as they're watching the shows, it's becoming 
you know, like Miles was saying, like, we're watching TV with them. We're not just presenting it to them anymore. We're watching it with them. We're seeing their responses. We're creating more of a community around watching the TV shows. And people that watch HGTV already are pretty rabid, avid users of social media. And so by giving them our voice along with it, by letting them talk to each other, by then showcasing their tweets on screen to show that we're paying attention and that we're hearing what they're saying, it's just kind of creating our a bigger audience for our show and a platform for them to talk, I guess, more. And that's, it's been super successful for us. So, yes. I was wondering if and how y'all accommodate um, non-real-time watchers, both in the editing stages and for you in adapting your product. And, and also, Johnny, what percent people even watch it on TV or TV or anything? You've got, you can speak to, you guys can know that more. <laughs> for the watching real time, um, for HGTV, DIY, all of our scripts networks, it's still pretty mostly live, not all. Um, our competition shows like Brother vs. Brother last summer, HGTV New Year this year, that those will get a little, um, not HGTV New Year, the Brother vs. Brother and any of our big competition-y things, um, people will DVR those a little bit more than other things. Um, but it's, you know, we'll gain a couple of ratings points, but not a ton because it's the kind of thing that you want to watch and like relax you know is there anything between the editing team like the, if they were watching something on demand do you keep in all the tweets and the real time stuff there i'll track that on a weekly basis just to see that they're talking about it but i mean no, we, that I can't get on screen the tweets just go on the one that's so if it's, if it's Friday night from 8 to 10 it'll be on those episodes on that stream but i don't think they carry over to the on demand because it kind of just yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, because things. Yeah, because that needs to be more evergreen. Basically, we need like an evergreen feed, so that goes onto the on demand. Um, but we do kind of connect with our audience that's watching at other times by just watching the feed with the hashtags. You know, we can promote HGTV New Year, but people will make their own hashtags all day all day long. So, for example, Rev Runs Renovation was on the other night. We had immediately said Rev Runs Reno because that was a shorter hashtag. Let's go with that. Everyone else in the world was like, no, the show is called Rev Runs Renovation. And so that was the hashtag that went out there. And so then we just immediately had to adapt to that. And we're like, OK, well, this is the new hashtag. So we changed some of our on-air promos, made sure that that was the hashtag. And then we can go back and watch that feed later on on Twitter. And we can favorite things, retweet things a little bit later on to let people know that we're paying attention to the conversation, even if it's not happening right then. So. Yeah, um, so uh, you know, so Viggel, um, we the audio check in the thing where you tap it and we listen and, and you, you uh, match to a show, we hold on the audio for seven days. So we, we support DVR viewing uh, for the audio check in, you know, live viewing plus seven, basically. Viggle Live is just for the live broadcast. Um, you know, that said, they're to, to sync with the broadcast and if uh, we're, you know, on some occasions, I'm actually watching an award show, for example, and, and pushing, um, pushing the content to let people predict the winner of an award, um, when that, broadcast is, uh, if it's not a simulcast show, if it's airing three hours later on the West Coast, we do on Big Live support that synced broadcast uh, in each time zone. And that, you know, that's been one of the, the kind of interesting uh, challenges to, to face is um, syncing a broadcast across time zones and sort of recognizing where a person is while they're watching. Um, you know, daylight savings time is, is, is interesting because parts of Arizona uh, for six months of the year, fall in between the, well, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. So um, it's uh, so there, there's a lot of um, there, there's a lot of sort of challenges around that. Um, but currently, live viewing is is uh, what we support and where where we see kind of the biggest bang for our buck. And uh, just for us, up until yesterday, we actually only had one high definition feed. So you know, eight o'clock East Coast. If you're in California and watching our HD feed. Um, you're getting it at five o'clock. Um, yesterday we went live with the West Coast feed, and so we're actually in conversations right now of kind of how to deal with that. Um, and then that kind of trickles down into things like staffing issues. Of you know, right now we've gotten to the point that we're that you know if we have to work from eight to ten on a Friday night, we can offset that by doing some other things. I don't know that we're going to get to the point that we're going to stick around and also have people working from eleven to one on the East Coast. So, you know, we're, we're evaluating some of those things, but it's, uh, Miles and I were talking this morning actually over breakfast, it's actually a, a pretty big um, topic in the industry right now of, of how to deal with 
with um, those types of things, time, you know, whether it's time shifting or whether it's time zones. So the so the question is how many people for anyone watching home yeah how many people are, are monitoring it so on New Year's Day it was anywhere from like five to seven people at any given time both responding curating um, we've gotten to the point for our Friday night shows um, the volume is a li is a lower than New Year's Day it's only two hours we can get by with um, kind of two active social people uh, and then we've got someone in the broadcast ops side that is there kind of just in case something happens and we need to pull the feed or, or something like that. Um, so we've, we've done it enough that we're comfortable with that. If we have something bigger going on, we'll ramp that up to three or four you know, people depending on, on you know, what's going on, level of priority, thing, things like that. We usually have one person running the tweets on air for Friday nights. That I, so if I'm moderating those tweets, then the second person is moder watching the Twitter account and watching the Instagram feed and kind of responding to people there. We haven't so far put things on screen yet, like that the on HGTV.com where we had to moderate the pictures. We haven't actually done that since New Year's Day, but we're starting to look into that a lot more. We're going to put feeds throughout our site, and so then we're going to have to start watching these hashtags and moderate things a lot more. So that's going to be more of a daily thing that someone's going to have to, you know, check the Instagram feed a couple times per day to okay 10 more pictures. Because in the Instagram world and Twitter world, we can't control the hashtag. People could put whatever they want and see it in the hashtag, but we can control what's on HGTV.com. And that's what we have to watch out for all the time because we are a huge brand and we have a reputation. And so we cannot let pictures or offensive things get through. So we're always, that's another staffing thing we're gonna kind of have to figure out in the next few weeks is as we're adding these social feeds to our pages, how exactly we're moderating them and how often. So it's an ongoing thing, I guess. So uh, Miller Lane on Twitter wants to know, um, have we found that uh, we gain more viewers on HGTV because of the social TV aspect? And you touched a little bit, but you know, kind of industry-wide and then maybe how it's impacting us. Can you talk, Christine, about um, how, how we're starting to measure things like that? I mean, overall, it would be lovely if HGTV was as big uh, getting as many tweets and ratings sometimes as like The Walking Dead or something, <laughs> but we're realistic. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but it's not always lining up. Like just because we have an event, it doesn't always increase ratings. But some of the Twitter events have been very, very highly rated. And like Brother versus Brother last year, they tweeted all the time because it's the Property Brothers and that's what they do. And you guys had such great things going on with it. And that was like a top five show for the year. And it would be like on the nights that it was on, ranked for a top five show for us, and it would be ranked like number four for women 2554 on the nights that it was on in all of cable, which is huge. And again, we can't 100% say it's the tweets because we don't have the tools to measure that, but it's not hurting. And it's often it lines up like on New Year's Day. Um, last year when we did some things with Biggle, I think it was like in April for Love It or List It, you know, we knew that we were going to be featured on Biggle and then there was a lot of stuff going on that you guys did, plus the scheduling team had an entire marathon for a couple of hours leading up to it, and the promotion people had a lot of things on screen, and that was one of the most highly rated days of the year. And it had also been the most social up to that point. So they are, it, it doesn't always happen, but it happens a lot. Yeah, and we've seen some other correlations, like with the show of everyone's renovation. It first premiered on DIY before airing on HGTV. When it aired on DIY, it had some of the lowest, the, the median age for that for DIY, which is a little bit younger than HGTV as well, but the median age is, was lower than kind of anything else that we have yes. on air. <laughs> Even for the month, it would have a median age in the low 40s, which is like, that's what everybody wants. <laughs> Even things like Comedy Central are. Yeah, and you know, uh, just anecdotally from following the conversation, he clearly brought the audience that you know started with him on his VH1 show and came over. So just 
we were following the, the comment stream. I mean, P. Diddy tweeted about DIY Network. When is that ever going to happen again? <laughs> um, hopefully for season two. Uh, um, All day, every day. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, but, you know, we, we could tell that it was a different type of crowd talking about that show, and that reflected not necessarily just in, purely in, in the number of people watching the show, but the kind of diversity and the age of the people watching the show as well. So, you know, those are also um, successes. Uh, for us. So I think we had another question in the back. Talk a lot about viewers. Can you talk a little bit about how this engagement impacts advertisers and consumers? Yeah. Um, sure. So maybe, Miles, if you want to start off how you guys are kind of, I mean, one of the reasons we've worked with you is because you, you're one of the few companies in this space that actually have a real business model um, <laughs> and work with work a advertisers that pay for these things. Yeah, you know, we, we, when we launched, we sort of had a revenue model out of the gate, and we needed to because, um, you know, we, we give real rewards for engaging with our app, and, and there's a hard cost to that. So it was very important to have an established uh, advertising model. And it's, you know, um, the... Uh, when you're watching TV and there, there's an on-air spot, um, th those same brand advertisers want to be able to reach people on their mo mobile device. Like I, like I said, everybody is on their mobile device. And, and so we created a platform that um, you know, encourages people to uh, watch ads within the app by getting points. And again, those points are, are redeemable for rewards. So we created kind of a, a really uh, interesting ad model. Um, and I think, uh, you know, so having the, this sort of uh, platform that, that can sort of reinforce the brand message that whatever the on-air spot might be on the second screen is something that is really important to us and something that's proven really effective. Um, and I think one of the things that I, I think is really interesting is when we're doing one of these big live events, um, we don't push content during the commercials. Uh, we, if, we're, if it's a big award show, um, a big event, we're, we're watching the show and during a commercial we put up a, a thing that says, hey, watch the commercials, enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a, a brand partner, we actually might even ask a question about one of those on-air spots because we're not we're not trying to compete with the intention attention of the the brands uh, you know sponsoring that show. So that's been a really cool kind of data point to be able to pass back to an advertiser to say, hey, um, you know, three minutes after your commercial aired uh, on air, we asked a question about it, and here's your brand effectiveness because 67 percent of people got the message that that was there. So that's a, you know, I, that's something kind of un unique to us and, and something that I'm really proud of and, and something that our brand partners have been really excited about. Go for it. Could you repeat her question? Yeah, so, so, the, the, um, so Next Guide is a product that's um, made by the company we acquired Digit. Um, so they're, they're now part of our family, which is awesome. Um, and so the question is basically, uh, when you set a reminder with, um, with the Next Guide product, you're asked for a little bit of information, such as your zip code and um, I think cable provider and, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, and does that information help you create a more refined marketing approach to, to being able to um, target certain messages to certain people. Absolutely. And, and Chad and I, over breakfast, were, were kind of, we had a very interesting breakfast in which we <laughs> spoke about social TV. Um, we, uh, so we, we, that's such a revolution, being able to kind of refine your marketing in a way that's so much smarter than, um, you know, uh, five years ago it may have been buying an advertisement on the side of a bus, and who knows, you know, like there, there's, you, you are kind of broadcasting this message to a bunch of people to whom, who, who are not interested in it, and and who, uh, and, and then you have no way of kind of measuring how effective that that side of the bus advertisement was. So what's really exciting, f and uh, something that we're we're kind of um, hoping is a really useful tool for networks that that we hope to provide is, um, you know, being able to take that information and sort of 
um, recognize who that person is throughout that kind of one week engagement cycle of, of uh, you know, setting the reminders. Uh, we know where they are, their cable provider, basic demo stuff. Um, unifying that, that kind of information with, you know, a, as a Vigil user and, and to uh, wet paint and being able to recognize and deliver um, messaging that is tailored for them. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the best both for the user because they're, they're getting stuff that they actually might be interested in, and it's the best for the brand partner because they're able to take their, their, um, their marketing dollars and, and use it in a really effective, targeted way and reach the people who, um, who may not know about their product or their, their show or their service or whatever, but send them a message that's totally appropriate. And, you know, it's, um, so that sort of targeting is, you know, social ad platforms are, are, are big and ev everybody's doing it. And, and we're definitely in the space where it's, again, it's great for both the partners and for the user because you're, you're all of a sudden getting really relevant stuff that you may not have known about. And, and yeah, so. One of the one of the things that originally actually drew us to working with Viggle is there was already without us having a relationship, we saw a lot of overlap between our viewers and people that were checking in through Viggle. So there was an organic relationship there that then, you know, how can we pump some marketing dollars in and kind of turn the volume up? And those are some of the things that we've we've worked together on. But you know, they have at least the last time I looked, like it's still a female skewing audience. Um, it's a little bit more upscale, you know, which, as you can imagine, on HGTV, that's kind of the core audience that we want as well. So you know, they had, because it's authenticated, because you have to register for the app, now with all these uh, additional things, we'll be able to get that much, we'll be able to fine tune that messaging much more. Um, and I just wanted to toss it back to you to talk about kind of how we're thinking about bringing sponsors onto the, into the social TV world. Yes, it's definitely kind of a, um a build it they will come type thing. We had to do our New Year's Day thing and put the tweets on screen to show the possibilities that advertisers and sponsors could have with our social TV aspect. Um, so now we're starting to develop different ways that we could incorporate sponsorship, me sponsorship messaging, logos, um, whether they could sponsor a whole night, whether they could sponsor a segment, individual tweets themselves, whether their messaging can go up. We're working with a lot of different departments throughout Scripps right now to work on all of this. We've got a figure out the graphical look, what kind of language we can do, how it would even impact the, the look and feel on screen. We're working on that right now, but it's definitely an exciting thing to have a whole other area that we could offer to advertisers and sponsors that would reach an audience that they know is watching and engaged right then. Um, so we had another question from Twitter that specifically asked, how does engagement affect advertising? I don't know if you can talk maybe a little bit about kind of what our engagement rates look like. Not purely from social, but like length of tune and things like that, and how we're able to, to work with our advertisers on that. Uh, to hit on the advertisers a little bit, they've also, our, my ad sales counterparts have been coming to me asking like, after we have a big event, like, all right, Rev Run just premiered on HGTV, like how many people have been tweeting about it? Like that's something that has to go on the one sheets now, and that's only been a, the last couple of months, but advertising clients and agencies, like they want that now, they want, things, um, engagement. Our length of tune, uh, now that we have more hour-long programs, um, whereas like DIY network is a lot of half-hour programs, and they'll the length of tune there will be like 12, 13 minutes, HGTV is definitely a little longer. Length of tune is how long you're watching something before you're switching to something else. So for HGTV, it's usually not hitting 20 minutes, that's reserved for like networks that are airing really long sporting events or like lifetime movies and things like that where people are kind of zoning in there for a long time. Um, but it's usually like just under uh, 20 minutes. Um, so we had another Twitter question specifically around um, what, did, what instructions, if any, were given to the on-air talent for things like New Year's Day or for Friday night? Um, Abby, if you want to talk about maybe starting with New Year's Day and then some of the other uh, more interesting things we've had with our, with our Friday night talent. Yes, sure. Um, we sent out a one-sheeter to all of our talents before New Year's Day aired, and we sent along those hats and noisemakers and things. And we basically said, we actually designated a host per hour of the day. So we said, um, Matt Blashaw, you're hosting for this hour. Nicole Curtis, you're hosting for this hour. Vanilla Ice, you're hosting for this hour. We made sure that we had someone that was promoting our tweet and hashtag that hour. Um, and that really worked for us. You know, their talent audience got engaged. They were super excited about it. They promoted the pictures on Instagram, on Facebook. 
that kind of helped build the audience too. Um, and then since then, we've worked with talent to host the Friday night specials. We had the brothers do it one night. That was huge. Um, and then we had David Bromstead do it one night, and then we had Nicole Curtis do it one night. Um, Nicole was an interesting bird. Um, one of the shows, because it was Renovation Realities, they were actually ripping out a kitchen. And if you ever watched Rehab Addict on HGTV, her whole spiel is to restore houses. So she was a little bit upset that they were ripping out a kitchen instead of restoring it. So um, she actually, she actually, it, it kind of works in our favor though because she said, you know, she was upset about it. People were kind of watching her hashtag to see what she was going to say. So it was almost the whole no publicity is bad publicity because she was tweeting along saying how she didn't like the show, but it made more people watch the show because then they were saying like, why isn't she like this? I have to turn on the TV and see what's happening here. So it kind of worked well. And then it was funny because then she turned on the next, she was, had to be the host for four episodes. And so that was the second episode of the night. By the next episode, it was a couple that was doing something amazing to their house. I can't remember what it was. And then she was like, this is the kind of show I want to see. And then for the next hour was like glowingly positive. So it was kind of an interesting ride to go along with her that night um, to see what she was going to say next. So we've kind of, we've given them a little bit of, um, you know, here's what to say, here's not what to say, don't put pictures of this, put pictures of this. We've given them a little bit of direction, but we also know that they all have their own personalities and David Bromstead's going to post crazy pictures on New Year's Day because that's what he does, but he also knows what not to post. So we've worked with all of them on some social training so that we can kind of anticipate what they're going to do with kind of showing their true colors at the same time. I think that's a natural segue to one of the questions I had, which is this idea that we're engaging these fans that are super fans and they feel ownership of these brands and like they know these people, they're in these very personal relationships. Right. And then something happens like I'm thinking more in terms of maybe I don't know, a popular character being killed off on the show or something like that. But hopefully that doesn't happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're gonna keep them all extreme <laughs> renovation <laughs> realities. <laughs> I mean, we definitely listen to ev everything that people are saying. I mean, for example, on that Nicole night, a lot of people were tweeting along and saying, you're right, we can't believe they're just throwing these cabinets away. Like, they should be taking them down and painstakingly restoring them and putting them back up. And so we were kind of, we kind of took a step back. We didn't necessarily say, like, yes, we agree with Nicole, or no, we don't agree with Nicole. We just kind of let them talk. So a lot of times that's kind of how we'll do it. We won't really jump in the conversation too much. We'll just let them talk. We'll let their community, build around it, whatever they want to say, but if it's something crazy extreme like a Property Brothers game or something, like we'll jump in and you know be the moderator there, but if they're kind of just having their own opinions about the shows, we'll let them have them. I mean, renovation is a personal thing, so. Did you put those on the bottom of the screen, or would those not get bookmarked? Um, we've put a couple. We, yeah, I mean, we, we've developed some internal guidelines of what gets put on the screen, so um, something you know around the renovation that's you know, if it's crazy or if, it, you know, obviously no foul language, things like that. Um, as long as they're not calling the homeowners names, like we get a lot of like, look at these more, like, you know, it's a great tweet up until like, hashtag these morons. And we're like, well, now we can't put you on TV. <laughs> um, like you failed there. So um, we've developed guidelines of what, to, of what to put on TV. And, you know, as long as, it, you know, overly negative around, um, you know, if they didn't like the color, yeah, or something like that. That we'll we'll put that up. Yeah, um, all day long. As long as it's not name calling or negative specifically towards a host. But actually, our hosts are okay towards like the couple because you know we're still casting that show, so we don't want. Yeah, we're we're still trying to find people. Um, but Miles, I know you guys have done some improvements to kind of start to recognize kind of super fans on shows. Like the more people check in. Um, you guys are awarding like badges and things like that yeah, to start. Yeah, we, we so um, along with points, I, I think the, the idea of um, achievements and in incentives and, and things like that translate to a lot of different types of applications that, that you might use and um, including like, I, I too often find myself like asking other people what level they're on in Candy Crush, which is like, <laughs> it somehow demonstrates my own like, whatever, a Billy at Candy Crush. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we, so we introduced something called fandom in, um, 
uh, in, in Viggle, which, you know, if you're a super fan of a show, so if you check in a lot, if you play Viggle Live a lot, if you are engaging, uh, if you're sharing your check-ins, if you're creating kind of a buzz around this show, um, you, you level up, essentially, and you get points for doing that, but you also get a certain status. And um, you know, being able to kind of hone in on, on those super users um, or power viewers or whatever you might call them um, is is definitely valuable because you can kind of start to get to uh, the the really the the good content. You know, the the people who are really well informed and and who have positive contributions to the conversation around a show. Um, so it all kind of you know, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of recognize that sort of thing. But that when there's so much discussion around a show, there that's sometimes not not a good experience because it's kind of like just a, a hum of, of, of conversation. But when you can really start to uh, drill down and find the people who, um, who for whatever reason, are, are um, the, the valuable contributors to that conversation and, and then elevate them and highlight them, that's, that's something we're working toward. And, and the, the thing that I think is uh, really creates uh, you know, that, that next level of, of engagement and, and value for the, the second screen. Um, one thing also that we do on our Friday nights is that Telescope, the program that we use to moderate our tweets, it has like a proprietary little number next to it. So it'll say 1 or 26 or 99. And that is the reach that that person has with their Twitter. Um, so if I have two great tweets that are both saying, HGTV Friday nights are my new cool thing, you know, love it or whatever. If one person has one, a 1 and one person has a 97, I'm going to put the 97 up all day long because that's going to get more reach, more people are going to see that because that means they put it on their own Twitter account and they have more followers which then equals more eyes which then could be more people viewing. So we kind of have our own little, along with our internal guidelines, we also just keep all of that in mind. So we're, we're watching a whole lot of stuff in those minute and a half you have to find eight new tweets. So we're watching all the content, those numbers, making sure that because sometimes we do have the super fans that'll watch the whole night and they'll put a tweet up every two minutes. And so you have to make sure that you didn't put at Abby McCollum up last segment and the segment before and the segment before. And so you kind of have to watch all of these factors at the same time, but then we can find the super fans by watching the numbers and reaching the people. So. And for the rest of the brand, I went in my re weekly roundup of kind of what's going on socially and with ratings for our three networks, I try to take a look at the kind of summaries of what people are saying and put that in there so that the like programming sees that kind of stuff. If mm -hmm. people are really not into something, they're complaining about the narrator on Farm Kings all the time. I'm going to kind of put that in there so that they can see people are talking about this a little more and they kind of hate it. Yeah. You know what I mean? More questions from the audience? Uh, anyone from this side? We've been very heavy <laughs> this side of Yeah, and everyone watch HGTV this Friday night and tweet along. <laughs> Your tweet could be on TV. You and Diddy together. Yeah, don't put links, don't put pictures, just put words. That's kind of what we've had to also teach our audience by what tweets are going to go online because we can't put tweets, we can't put pictures. I mean, we can't put links, we can't put pictures. So we've kind of had to recognize that, and people start to learn too. Yeah. People, you know, we'll, we'll throw a bone to the people that say, my mom says she'll give me $10 if my tweet goes online. We'll put those up, you know, every now and then, but for the most part, people kind of are giving us the tweets that we want. Thank you. Thank you. Very small token. Um, great panel. Great job and a very, very timely topic. It's something that we talk about in the social media class all the time. Um, and I will say, too, Chad came as a guest speaker to my class um, three years ago. And I had a student there that the last question of the day was, what do you see as an upcoming really important topic with social media? Um, what's a trend for the future? And Chad said social TV. And literally, he's back here three years later talking about it. So, I mean, he is a true expert um, in the area. I can so say that. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are a lot of numbers for three years. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's better than nothing. <laughs> so, I hope you all sign the sign in sheet because that's how we're going to pick our um, winners. All right. So, um, I'm going to.